If one goes to the town of Lucerne, Switzerland, one will probably be asked if they saw the lion. However, I'm not talking about a lion lion, like at the zoo. I'm talking about the carved statue, the Lion of Lucerne. Now, normally I would be all for talking and looking at pictures of a real cat, but in this case, the history behind this monument is actually extremely interesting. Due to the circumstances that led its creators to memorialize a Swiss Guard regiment, but we will get to that. Upon first inspection of just looking at the monument, it might look like a nice little way to turn an abandoned quarry into a park near the middle of this small medieval town. And really, if you go unprepared to see the lion in person, the chances are that you won't be able to read the Latin text, or if you're like me and can't translate Roman numerals higher than the last French king, you would be leaving yourself unaware of the tragic backstory behind the monument that Mark Twain once called the most mournful and moving piece of stone in the world. The story, however, actually begins roughly 300 miles away in Paris, at the fall of the Bastille in 1789. Once again, I certainly do not have time to cover the breadth of the French Revolution in this video, but maybe in the future. I do, however, have to explain the run-up to the circumstances the Swiss Guards, who we'll be talking about later, found themselves in in Paris in 1792. Anyway, the important event here is that on October the 5th, 1789, a group of angry women, due to severe bread shortages, along with some revolutionaries who may or may not have been planning to stoke anti-monarchist sentiment, with the starving commoners on purpose, marched all the way out to Versailles, eventually resulting in the storming of the famous palace and forcing the return of the monarchy to the center of the city. The royal family was essentially put under house arrest in the Tuileries Palace from the 5th of October 1789 to the 10th of August 1792. The king and his family would be confined to the palace. Excepting 20th, 21st of June 1791 to the 25th, when the king and his family fled, and made it as far as Varennes, but that's a completely different story. We're, we're just going to skip that for now. If they weren't considered under outright house arrest before, they most certainly were now, after their attempted escape. As I alluded earlier, the royal family did not stay in the Tuileries and live happily ever after, as I'm sure you, the viewer, knows how the story ends. But the story of how the king moderately attempted to fight for his family's life in the face of the Parisian mob is where we're going. Even though the king expressed support for the new constitutional government, and had actually donned the red hat of liberty and drunk wine with revolutionaries to show his support. On the 19th of June, it was announced he actually used his constitutional power of veto over the Legislative Assembly on three decrees, and was accused of treason for preventing their passage. The first was a bill for deporting priests, another eliminating the King's Guard, the third guaranteeing a baguette to every citizen, and the last calling for adding 20,000 more federés or revolutionary troops to Paris. Paris was starting to turn against the king, seeing him as a direct threat to their safety and their baguettes. They saw the acts he was vetoing as critical to the war effort. Combined with his previous flight to allegedly go join the enemy, because remember, Marie Antoinette was a Disney princess. Wait, shit. Austrian princess. On top of the past Treaty of Pilnitz a year earlier, which declared Prussia and Austria would support the French king over the revolution. And then going even further, on August 1st, the Duke of Brunswick, issued a manifesto which threatened violence on any civilians who opposed the king whenever the Allied armies reached Paris, which in the people's mind was enough to convince them that he was the enemy. During the summer of 1792, fear was starting to take hold in Paris, as the enemy armies were encroaching on French territory and would soon reach Paris itself. On August 3rd, a petition from 47 out of 48 sections of Paris, which were basically small governmental bodies of the city where citizens could attend and vote on issues, were calling for the king to forfeit the throne. They set the date of the 9th of August for when the sections would meet for their consultation of what to do with the king. On the 4th of August, one of the 48 sections of Paris issued an official decree demanding the despicable tyrant be deposed. The sections, as the summer wore on, were growing increasingly militant against the king and even the National Assembly, the elected unicameral legislature of France. Although the National Assembly was considering suspending temporarily, the king's power as punishment, they were not ready to go so far as deposing him completely and abolishing the monarchy. The assembly condemned the actions of the sections and declared them unconstitutional, and it issued a statement inviting all citizens to contain their zeal within the limits of the law. Like, you think the French would understand that containing their zeal within the limits of the law is very hard for them. I mean, look at the streets of Paris two weeks ago. I mean, you, you get my point. Anyway, 
It was also by this point, in the beginning of August, that the Federes, who remember Louis XVI had vetoed to stop a contingent of 20,000 of them from being stationed in Paris, started arriving in the capital on their own accord. These Federes brought a new song from the Army of the Rhine, and it just so happened to be the soldiers who brought it to Paris were from Marseille. Yeah, that song. Dark shame, darling, dark shame. Damn it, not that one. The, the real one. On the night the sections had chosen for their meeting, the 9th of August, 47 of 48 sections sent delegates to the Hotel de Ville, the town hall of Paris. Keep in mind, they were not the city government of Paris. But they however walked into the building unopposed and set up their own new municipal government in the same building as the old one while it was still in session. From midnight till three in the morning, the two municipalities were in session in adjoining rooms in the Hotel de Ville. By the morning, they had informed the real government they were taking control. By this point, they had also requested the presence of the leader of the National Guard at 4 a.m. Quick side commentary here. I don't know why everyone in Paris happened to be up in the middle of the night during this entire event, but I digress. Interestingly enough, it was the Marquis de Lafayette, until very recently, who happened to be the leader of the National Guard. But he had never been officially replaced, so the next highest officer of rank, a man named Mondant, appeared before the assembly. He was promptly removed from his position and replaced with someone more favorable to the revolutionaries. And then as he was leaving, was shot and thrown into the Seine. Once they were in full control of the city government, by the morning of the 10th of August, the attack on the Tuileries Palace and the king began almost immediately. By 7 that morning, the National Guards, Federes, and people of Paris had marched from the Hotel de Ville and had been spotted coming up behind the palace in the Place de Carousel. Louis, who was half asleep, happened to be reviewing his garrison force that was supposed to protect the palace, and from some of the National Guard soldiers who were part of his defense, he was met with shouts of Viva la Nation and Abal la Vito, meaning they stood with the rebels. Realizing it was hopeless, he gathered his family and retreated across the Tuileries Gardens in front of the palace to the National Assembly building itself, hoping that seeking shelter there would protect him and his family, crossing through crowds of protesters with the assistance of guards. Even though the palace was abandoned, Louis never countermanded his orders to defend the palace, leading the Swiss mercenaries and small number of gendarmes who were stationed there with the last order they were given, defend the palace. The National Guard and citizens of Paris proceeded to try and convince the defenders to surrender and join against the tyrant. The guards held their ground. The rear of the palace was soon under attack. At first, the Swiss defenders actually managed to push back the massive attackers out of the place to carousel, but soon had to retreat as they were heavily outnumbered, only leaving around 900, albeit with cannon. With the original complement assigned to defend the king being 5,000, as many of the French troops who had been assigned either deserted or switched sides, it was no wonder that they were being pushed back. The Swiss were soon forced to retreat to the palace itself and defend it. By 9.30 a.m., cannons could be heard from the legislative assembly, firing as the massive people attempted to storm the palace, and the Swiss tried to stem the tide. The king eventually realizing either he had forgotten to give the order to abandon the empty palace, or for some other reason lost to history, he sent a new order to the Swiss. The king orders the Swiss to lay down their arms at once and retire to their barracks. This, however, arrived in the midst of the worst fighting, and was considered to be suicidal by the defenders as they were holding and eventually had killed and wounded 376 people. Fearing retribution for the casualties they inflicted, they did not want to surrender. The cannon stopped by 11 a.m., and it assumed most of the Swiss died after they gave up their defense, as over 600 out of 900 would end up being killed, many from angry Parisians seeking their revenge. Some seeking retreat the same way the king had gone, through the gardens, were captured and carried off to the Hotel de Ville and guillotined under a statue of Louis XIV. Leader of the Swiss mercenaries, Major Karl Joseph von Bachmann, was captured and arrested shortly after. He was eventually guillotined for refusing to surrender to the people on September the 3rd, 1792. The 10th of August would become known as the end of the French monarchy, and essentially as the start of the revolution into the bloodthirsty beheadings that would become known as the terror. But this story is not only of events in Paris, but also of that certain line in Lucerne. Karl Pfeiffer von Altershofen 
I please forgive me on that pronunciation, was a member of the Swiss mercenaries who were employed to protect the king, and interestingly enough, a former classmate of Napoleon Bonaparte. But on the fateful morning of the 10th of August, and during the subsequent arrest and beheadings of his colleagues, he was on routine leave of absence back in Switzerland. While home, this is when he learned that his regiment had suffered a roughly 70% casualty rate while he was on vacation. He was apparently shocked and deeply saddened by the fact that he had been spared while his compatriots had been beheaded by the French mob. Still being a mercenary, he then employed himself to the Italians defending Piedmont against revolutionary France's incursions into northern Italy, and served there fighting the French from 1793 through 1798 until he was captured and then allowed to return to Switzerland. In 1819, he would found the Lucerne Art Society. This is when he commissioned Bartel Thorvaldsen, a Danish sculptor, to design a dying lion monument for his comrades who had fallen without him in 1792. The line was then completed in Althofschen's garden by Thorvaldsen's student, a horn von Konstanz, between 1820 and 1821. The inscriptions on the monument read as follows. Dedicated to the fidelity and the courage of the Swiss. On August 10th, September 2nd, and September 3rd, 1792. Here are the names of those who, so not as to evade their oath of fealty, fell in heroic battle. 26 fallen officers, 760 fallen soldiers, 18 surviving officers, 350 surviving soldiers. Citizens came together and erected this lasting monument to this event, completed on August 10, 1821.